pay for slave funds. You know, the ah, people, yes, yes. The, the Hamas people who are getting paid just to kill Jews. Now, this particular uh, gentleman or whatever you want to call him, Ding dong. this guy has done more damage to the image of Canada. I guess the, the last person who damaged the image of Canada was his father. Now, do you think the, that the right of LGBTQ was was a great idea, but now they have pushed it a little too much? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like too far too quickly. Like you're, you're in this echo chamber. India produces maximum IT professionals. Canada produces comedians. So, all right, so you, I was watching one of your shows and you said that you are, you feel like you are a pretty chick with a million of Indian TV producers trying to talk to you, calling you again and again and again. Please elaborate on that. How did you feel, feel like this? I think that was on Kushal Mera's podcast, I said. Yeah, this was a yeah, yeah, you, you, did, you did. Yeah, yeah, I said, like, I, I was a pretty girl on a dating app or something, like, uh, was my thing. Just like, you, you, you can imagine just being an, an attractive girl on a dating app, because everyone, yeah. Um, but that's kind of what it felt like, you know, I, you know, I've done, I've been in this for a while. I've had a certain level of success, and but it was just like nothing when I make going the viral video in a country of 1.5 billion people, and then you know there was the Rajdeep thing, and then it that what exploded. Then after that, like what it was like a bunch of producers getting in contact with me, and then like managing Twitter Spaces and whatever, and then I did the hit on you know Rajdeep show, and then after that, like it was it, it was just like a torrent of uh, of things, and I haven't managed now. Like I, I have like a lot of the producers from different things. Like I have their name now. I have them labeled. Um, but like a lot of it was just like WhatsApp because I gave one guy my number on Twitter or whatever. And and just like different WhatsApps with like nine 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 four nine nine. It's just like different ones. Like just hello, can you come here? Can you go there? Can you do this? Can you do that? And like we're a small media outlet. Um, so you know, I don't have a secretary to be like, you know, Karen, manage my whatever thing. It's just like <laughs> me on TV, booking other TV things, just like. And there's a nine and a half hour time difference at this time, yeah, right? So yeah. this happens and it's nine and a half hours. So I'm I'm a sleep deprived lunatic rambling about Calistanis <laughs> halfway across the world and people are loving it. But then it's just like the, the DM, the, right? It's you, you feel bad, like you can't keep up with every DM. And then like, it's kind of like if you accept a nice DM and then people even say nice things to you, it like buries the other DMs you kind of need to manage a bit more. So you like feel bad because like, you, you're people are now saying nice things to me, and I I usually respond because like I thank you, that's very nice of you. But I but if you do that, then they like go in the other thing, and if they respond, it varies. Like that is just like you got to keep it. Like if I'm being asked a specific question, I'll 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 answer it. Or if someone's like I'm in Toronto, how can I help? With this I'll be like okay that. But you know you feel bad like you know the the you support genocide in India. You are a blah 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 blah. We're Pakistan like that ignored. Right. But now I kind of at the point where I kind of also have to ignore people saying nice things or also just I, I won't be able to manage any any work. So yeah. I guess I guess now I understand why hot girls don't respond to me uh, on him. <laughs> like, I get it. Like you, you, there's only so much time in the day. I see how you look. Right. I get this. Right. So. Right. But one of my favorite things to do is say insane things to pretty women. So I, I enjoy it. It's, and, and sometimes they yeah. do are horrified. So this is I was, I was, I was actually, I was looking at, at, I, I saw a couple of your, your shows with different people. Okay. And, and it was very logical answers, which you gave. So that made me, I was like, okay, all right, we have to speak to Daniel because you know, he's the most logical Canadian I have spoken to so far. That is a sad <laughs> indictment on my country. If, if, <laughs> If if a if a if a quasi stand up comedian journalist is is the most is the most logical insane person in the country that's a red flag. Thank you for the compliment, uh, but yeah, yeah. also it's a bit of an SOS for the rest of us. Okay, but but let me ask you something that that Canada being the uh, I mean it's like India produces maximum IT professionals, Canada produces comedians. Okay, so you are not in minority in Canada. I mean there are so many comedians which are, I mean you have that that show just for. For laughs, right? right? The, the festival for show, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 an outstanding right. channel. But but then when you see Canada's culture evolving in such a such a liberal way, that the Canadian conservatives are also liberals, actually. I mean, a Canadian conservative is a liberal in America. I mean, if yeah. you look at it, 
yeah. it, on, on a lot of issues more right wing on some issues like you know your taxes and whatever like they'll want to cut the corporate but yeah the, you're you're right that canadian conservative party is probably closer politically to the american democrat party than the republicans so so my question is that you know let's if you if we go to the the root cause of the problem and and let me look at the questionnaire which i prepared what what i think that the phenomenon of the so called liberal parties okay all over the world i'm not saying specific to canada let's go to america india or other countries the con the parties which claim to be the liberal parties they want to capitalize on the immigrants be it legal illegal because they yeah. think that these people are my permanent vote bank they're not going nowhere i mean if you see the 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 situation in toronto or new york or chicago or you see the uh, los angeles and san francisco or the border of america even in india in india we have in new delhi there are 40000 illegal immigrants who live in you know in in different slums and they are illegal immigrants we all know about it but we're not supposed to talk about it so So do you see this as a phenomenon that everybody is doing it? Yeah, in a way, I think you kind of outlined the the incentives to do this, right? It's like uh vote bank strategies. And and to and I think we're starting to learn to see some of the flaws in that. Right, especially in Canada like the parental rights movement, right? This is the insane sex ed curriculums, the the teaching trans stuff to to 7-year-olds and all this. And when you import people, let's say from Iraq, they're going to have views of Iraqis. And Saddam Hussein and whatever um Iranian proxy ruled after him. Saddam Hussein was not famous for dancing in the pride parade. He did not have a gender unicorn in schools. Same thing with Lebanon, Syria, um Somalia, Eritrea, like a lot of these countries. So one of the flaws of the left is they believe that because they are the morally upright virtuous people and they stand for the rights of the browns that the browns will then be like them right have the same opinions as them because they are good they are smart and they support migrants and immigrants and diversity but they don't understand these cultures at all it's just this sort of i'm over here above you and i'm protecting you from Daniel Boardman, the big evil scary, you know, right-wing talking head guy. And I think like the reason why I think the success I've had in India is like paralyzed a lot of people in Canada who are, who are critical of me is it's sort of a culture sh a shock to them that I actually have some understanding of Indian society that they don't. And it's not like a deep understanding, right? It's complicated, multifaceted society with a I think there's 1.5 billion Indian people and like two and a half billion languages spoken there or something like that, right? So like the incredible like we talked about cultural diversity and all that. Like India is sort of incomprehensible to anyone even Indian experts, right? But there is at least some sense of that I get your political situations, your human beings, you can map on and it's not so hard to delineate that you know the guy with running a terrorist training camp AK47 is going kill 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 we're going to kill all the hindus kalistan tiger force kill 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 he might be a bad guy and we shouldn't be doing this right and i think there's a lot of like gaslighting i get it as a jew because we get it too but also in the hindu community like there's a lot of gaslighting where you're looking at hardeep singh najar running a literal terrorist training camp like praising it in 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 his institutions and everyone around him they don't even hide it they put up billboards the posters they make speeches they film it themselves and put it out how much more evidence do you need right but canadians are burying their heads in the sand and it's sort of this shock that a lot of like my opponents are dealing with where it's like no i'm protecting these communities and these communities from daniel and then they see that the perception of their community is no i'm the one standing up for them against you know the center left enabling of, of terrorism and then they really can't grasp with this because there's i think there's a belief that they want to have that everyone on the right is a white person and standing for white people like that's a lot of the western things and when you get down to it well like no here i am like talking about you know very popular in the iranian community because i stand up to the islamic republic and i support the iranian people's struggle for freedom and I'm very popular now in the Indian community because I stand up against you know Khalistani terrorists who want to murder them all and quite clearly I do this right and it's sort of the shock that you know all the people they're claiming that they're protecting uh from me like oh no 
I'm actually standing with it. And it's it's this it's this sort of you know bewilderment that is I think just had a lot of like you know the alt right telegram channels are very mad at me. They always have been. You know the insane communists, whatever. But these sort of you know classical center left establishment types who would turn their nose up in the air at me and and, and, and this. I think they're having a very hard time understanding or they're starting to understand maybe and and see the light so i think there is some positive um to 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 a lot of this now where you're seeing the realignments uh you're seeing a lot of these vote bank politics stuff failing i mean again a lot you're right like they're trying to rig census uh census data they're trying to um fast track the ability for people to vote who just uh came in as refugees or migrants like not go through the full citizenship like you could vote on permanent residence and like yeah, that's such a clear, like, the liberals are importing a voting base. Um, but this is dangerous to them because when you do that, part of that narrative is, like, you want to keep them angry. Like, a part of the left-wing thing mm -hmm. is you want to sell the narrative that you are poor and oppressed and life is worse for you than it is for them because the system is racist. Vote for us, we'll fix the racism, you'll do better. But that's pretty contingent on them being poor, right? So the incentives are to keep them poor and oppressed to sell them a boogeyman. Right. And this this is right. When you do that, then the crime and then the this. So it's it's a it's a very, very corrosive system for and, and it's all over the world because some cynical politicians will always blunder into a way to, hey, I think this could be a short term solution to get me elected in the next four years. And a lot of Western politicians don't think or a lot of politicians in democracies. I think a function of democracy. I support democracy. I'm not saying it against it. It's the like it's the worst form of government except for all the others. Um, but one of the flaws is it incentivizes four-year plans instead of 40-year plans. And, 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 and that's something that I think we're going to need to get a grip on as democratic societies. And, and, and that's a cultural issue too, um, but sort of above my pay grade to fix that one. So I was, uh, uh, thank you for that. And I was actually looking for uh, one of the guys who's, who happens to be the prime minister of Canada. Now, this particular uh, gentleman or whatever you want to call him. Ding dong. This guy, <laughs> this guy has done more damage to the image of Canada than, than I guess the, the last person who damaged the image of Canada was his father. Now, this guy is like, he has gone a little more than his father. I'd say way more because his father at least had charisma and intelligence and there was some charm there. There's like sort of pirouetting around the queen and there was a competence to it. There was a radical leftist um, enabling of all this type of stuff, right? He took the country down a, a, a dark path economically, destroyed the energy sector in the West, uh, reignited the schism between the West and, and the rest of Canada. Um, you know, and, you know, he, he was a bad man, like morally, like there are stories of him dressing up in Nazi paraphernalia and driving on the streets of Montreal, P Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and like honking at, at, at Orthodox Jews for fun as a teenager. Like that's, that's the type of guy he was. So yes, Pierre did that, but the image of Canada, um, I think took an even bigger hit because Justin's a bit more buffoonish less intelligent, less charismatic. There's lots of um, uh, um, uh, diversity. You know, he's been turned into a meme in your country. We all did the yeah, meme. Yes, right? It, it, right? You know, I spoke I spoke on the Eagles podcast. We spoke about this. We also spoke about India and the need to uphold and respect the rule of law, right? You know, that's... that's so so I, was, I was talking to one of my friends and he said, uh, today when dad came home, I spoke to him. We spoke on, on a lot of matters. And then I mentioned the, the rule of law and, and how Canada's rule of law should be upheld. So people are making fun of Trudeau in their homes that when I'm talking to my dad, yeah. I asked him to uphold the rule of law and the nature <laughs> killing in Canada. So, you know, so they, they, he just became a kind of a joke. But, but let's go on a little bit serious matter. What about uh, the, the hypocrisy of Trudeau? Because when the truck drivers reached Ottawa, he froze their bank accounts. He he brought emergency to the capital. He was brutal to them. And then this guy is trying to be the epitome of freedom of expression and for other countries. What do you have to say on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the hypocrisy and gaslighting is sort of standard at this point. It's it's extreme and standard. Like, I mean, I, I nicknamed him the gaslighter in chief for so long, right? So the, he defends freedom of expression for Khalistanis to openly threaten to murder Indians and Hindus uh, after, you know, a pattern of doing so 
for decades, right? Remember, they invited Jasper Athwal, who's convicted of attempted murder on an Indian official, to their interview. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? There's the trucker thing where, yes, they froze bank accounts without criminal orders, and they cracked down, and they declared an emergency, that, that, that. But, you know, it goes deep in that. So this is a freedom of expression guy. Well, he's currently trying to censor the internet. Canada, if you don't, if you don't know, Canada cannot, Canadians cannot see news on Facebook and Instagram right now. And that's about to be Google too. We're North Korea, Iran, that, that, China. That built C11. C11 and C18, yeah. There's two yes. of them work together. There's okay. a, like the liberals are very clever and nefarious the way they've structured their censorship re regime where I call it like the laundering of censorship. So C11 is like the online streaming act. We're like, oh, we're going to only, they want to get the CRTC. Those are like the government bureaucrats. They regulate TV and radio right now. It's a bunch of like old boomer communists who should probably, you know, quit. But they, you know, if you, if you want to get any grants in Canada or you want to be Canadian content. So Canada, you need like a certain level. Of, I can't remember the percentage, but to be radio and TV stations in Canada need to have a certain percentage of Canadian content. And you would think. If I were to make a song and I'd sing, you know, something, something, Calistan, um, that would be Canadian content. But no, in order for it to be counted as Canadian content, it has to be registered with the CRTC to be even considered. So you have to submit yourself to government regulation bureaucracy. And the CRTC can change your lyrics and, and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, this can't go in the air, right? Then it's Canadian content. So they want to promote Canadian content on the internet, which means regulated government Canadian content on the internet. And they're doing this thing with like, oh, you know, only uh, streaming services of people with more than $10 million of revenue will be forced to register. So their mercenaries in the media will say, Daniel's just a fear mongering. He's not making $10 million a year. Yeah, I'm not making $10 million a year. You know, it is making $10 million a year or more. YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, like all the hosting sites, they have to register. They have to submit to CRTC regulations and they have to play that game. So when you put stuff on those sites, then the CRTC forces YouTube to regulate you. And then when you go and complain that you're being censored, the mercenaries in the media will then say, you're not, your, your charter rights don't protect you from free, from private companies. It's the government that you can't be censored by, not private companies. This is just the consequences of your own actions. But any reasonable person can see like the censorship is coming from the government onto those companies who are then passing it on to you, right? So that's a, like the laundering of censorship that Trudeau is doing. Um, and yeah, like you can't find an issue where he isn't an extreme hypocrite on um to, to the nth degree so yeah and then he goes to india and lectures them on the need for calisthenics to threaten to kill everyone when you know he's the biggest hate speech fear monger um you know like you know banning and attacking alternative media you know uh, he called parents who um you know were protesting uh the the all the insanity you know he called them all racist hateful transphobic bigots then two days later he said he didn't do it even though the tweet was still up and we could screenshot and be like this is what you said um right but he he bailed out the mainstream media the legacy media in canada is an oligarchy and it's funded by the government and there's two major telecom companies rogers and bell both of them lobbied with the government for these censorship laws so you're not seeing any talk of censorship on these major platforms because again they benefit their content already sucks and no one watches it it sucks we it sucks i i i i watch it it's terrible to complain about it but the the reason they're not doing successful stuff online and they're not making money online is because they put out boring content they don't know how to do a thumbnail they don't know how to do anything the experts they bring on are antiquated losers who have nothing interesting to say about anything they're just doing the sort of like if you learn, like if you learn like foreign policy or domestic policy speak, like I've never been to the, I didn't, thank God I don't have a degree in like foreign policy or domestic policy or any of that. Because you just learn to say these words, like, you know, they're covering, you know, a foreign policy thing like Israel or whatever. It's just like, oh, there's an escalation, a de-escalation, no escalation, a tick for that. <laughs> this is what we call a strategic. It's like, this isn't what it's about. Like just say, you know, Hamas, this is what they believe. This is what they did. This is their plan. You know, Israel, this is just like, like they don't give anything interesting. It's just these these focus group think tank words and phrases that get put out and then it gets put on social media. And these guys have millions of followers on social media. They're major media companies, like a million followers. They'll put it out, two likes. Like, <laughs> you can't, like they can't even get their own people to like it. Two <laughs> likes. Like you have like you anything, if you were like, you have a social media strategy, shouldn't you get your social media team to be like, yo, like and 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 retweet everything we put out. That's your job, just to help push the algorithm. They can't even get their own people to like it. No one likes this, and that's why they're not making money online. And they went around 
and they complained, oh, it's so hard to make money online. And this like, no, alternative media has figured it out left and right. Like Canada lands left wing alternative in Canada. They figured out how to, how to build an audience. National Telegraph figured out how to build an audience, you know, through North rebel media, like there's online media, you can do it. You can do the news. You just have to like provide it to people in an interesting manner. Like, the, if you get 45 minutes of an hour show in Canadian mainstream news, you could condense it all to maybe five minutes of news is actually in there. The rest of it is just saying the same things, useless commentary about whatever, like just analyzing the most asinine and name part of a story, hyper fixating and like the fringe element of the story, like where it isn't like can in India, like, oh, there's an escalation and a de-escalation and will embassies be recalled where there's escalating tensions? You want to de-escalate tensions and the thing and like they're saying like, the problem is there's Calistanis running around to threatening to kill everyone. And they're threatening to do terrorist attacks in India like they've done for years. And we have evidence of it. Look at this guy. Look at what he's saying. This is the problem. The Calistan Tiger Force, which has a lion in its insignia because they're Calistanis. This is this, this. But no, we don't talk about this. We go escalation, de-escalation, escalation, de-escalation. Escalation, de-escalation, and that's the but news. Don't you, don't you think that that I think that the Canadian media and Justin Trudeau, I think this, if you see these people, the way you were saying that they're trying to explain everything to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, technically correct language, don't you think that the liberals' idea has gone wrong? I mean, because the content is of five minutes, and if you have to say that content of five minutes in 15 minutes because of the so-called uh, technically correct words, I think that's the liberal thoughts and liberal media going wrong. Do you agree to that? Yeah, there's a lot of it. Like we saw in Canada, like there was a directive put out by the CBC to not call Hamas a terrorist organization, even though it's a listed terrorist organization by the Canadian government. And they're an arm of the Canadian government, right? They they do this all the time. They, they use the hyper progressive terminology. Like this is how we cover things. There's no freedom and stuff. And like one of the things that I say I love about Indian media and Indian TV, and I hope you never change this. You just get a Zoom link, a vague description of what you're going to be talking about, and you go. And you ask a question, you can say whatever you want. In Canada, that's not the way it is. Uh, all these major news networks, like, they'll have you on for a pre-interview. So they'll be like, oh, what are you going to say? And if it's like, well, yeah, if we're going to talk about the India issue, I'm going to bring up the Calistani thing. And then they're going to be like, okay, yeah, you're not coming on TV. Right? So they pre-select what they're going to be saying and the analysis they're going to be getting beforehand. So it's all fake. Like it's all fake. Like they've said it before. None of it is re like none of it is real or, or emotional. Like, yeah, again, I'm not saying in an hour of news, you get nothing out of it. There's a few points here and there, but in an hour, like a few points here and there, like we've already done in 20 minutes more interesting content than will be on the CBC in an entire day by maybe a factor of two. Um, and, and like, that's the reason why, mainstream media is failing in, in the West is because... Exactly. What do you have to say on Jordan Peterson's controversy? Because I love Jordan Peterson. I, I liked his ideas when he speaks, apart from few, which I don't agree to. But yeah. most of the ideas which he proposes, I like. And what do you have to say on the controversy? And also, what is this social media training thing? What what do he needs to do now? Yeah, so this is the recent controversy. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I started, like, I sort of decided to switch from stand-up comedy into more serious matters at the same time sort of the Jordan Peterson kind of did like I remember like okay we were in it for a few months and they were like there's this professor in Toronto doing this so again he's from Toronto I'm from Toronto um yeah I, again I you can't support everything everyone says that's a like True. you know he's been very vocal we I mean we both have been very vocal for the last you know eight years let's say and I think if he agreed with everything I said and I agreed with everything he said like I think he'd be lying or I'd be lying Right, um, I support. Maybe, support. maybe, maybe you 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 will be part of LGBT because they all agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's it, that's the thing. It's like the, the progressive mindset. We're like, oh, we all have to pretend to agree, but it's it's not even an agreement. It's like a social hostage situation there, where like where the most insane person says something and they all fall in line. It's not actually agreeing. It's just like it's a it's you know it's a Stalin's territory. So the thing with Jordan Peterson was um, the college regulators. Um, got very mad that he was putting out tweets that were against Trudeau and they want to censor him and have him retrain. And that was one of the things he spoke up against be to start with is like the racial re-education training in universities. One, they're shown to be not just ineffective, but have adverse effects and make people more racist. Two, it's a, it's a, it is a free speech, free expression, a major freedom concern. You can't, for you can't forcibly re-educate people. I'm sorry. 
that's not what we do. This isn't the Soviet Union. There's no re-education. It's not working. You know, are we going to try and build a clockwork orange type machine where we can torture Jordan Peterson to make him into like someone who's like, I support trans rights. Like maybe that's the plan. <laughs> maybe if we torture Jordan Peterson long enough, he will come out and, uh, and support trans rights. Maybe like that's the plan. So the college wants to him to submit to some media sensitivity training thing. I'm pretty sure he's not going to go and he'll take this to the Supreme court and fight this to the end. Um, yeah, this is like the corruption in institutions, the legal systems fallen, the, the, the regulators have fallen, the government's fallen, the media's fallen all into this diversity, equity, inclusion nonsense. There's no respect for free expression or Western values among our, our elites, um, in Canada. And there's two sets, there's two different rules for Canadians. There's the rules for those who follow establishment thinking and the rules for those who don't. So if you're inside the establishment and you are part of it, like the Khalistani movement, which is a very established movement in Canada, very, 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 very small in, in terms of population to both the Canadian population and the Sikh population, very, 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 very overrepresented in our government compared to the population of anyone else. Um, so yeah, so if you're if you were Khalistani, you're a part of the Liberal Party, part of the NDP, Kill, 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 kill. I'm going to threaten to kill you. I'm going to threaten to kill you. I'm going to threaten to kill you. We're going to film our terrorist training camps. So we're going to film me teaching them how to kill. We're going to film me talking about all the different people who've done such great things like murder and murder and murder and murder. This is great. Free expression. It's the most free country in the entire world. People like me who say, wait a minute. That's bad. We are under threat of, you know, the World Seek Organization or something filing a frivolous lawsuit against us and forcing us to pay $50,000 in legal fees and fight for three years to have the right to say that, you know, maybe killing Hindus is bad, bad, maybe, maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay. Another thing is that there are two neighboring countries of India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Both of them blamed uh, not just Trudeau, but the Canada, because Sri Lanka went back to the Tamil time and said, you know, Canada has been harboring them as well, not just these Khalistanis. So what is happening is that maybe India has called out Canada's bluff uh, by doing what they're doing right now. Or, I mean, it's sort of like the first one to break. And I think a lot of countries like, I mean, I'm in Toronto every year. The Tamil Tigers fly their flags and have a massive car parade going up the streets, just like Tamil Tiger City, just all of the thing. I'm like. Guys, those are the Tamil Tigers. It's not like, yeah, it's couched in the, oh, yes, victims of the blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing. But, like, guys, you need to learn the history of who the Tamil Tigers were. But, again, they bully themselves. They call themselves a human rights movement. They say they're the oppressed victims. They were forced to commit uh, all those acts of terrorism because blah, 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 blah. And most Canadians just don't either know a lot of politicians are very stupid never underestimate how stupid a politician is you, they're in fancy suits um they yeah, speak yeah. fancy talk but they're so dumb uh, on the thing so never doubt the ability for a politician to see someone waving a tamil tiger flag and be like oh that's a human rights activist because they told me they were um and they have money so they have yep. money and they told me something it must be true this is the the mentality of about 95 percent of politicians in canada the best example is that Nazi, which came to the parliament. <laughs> I'm not sure if you saw the video I made on this, but like Christopher Freeland came in and, and confirmed that everyone in the Liberal Party is mentally challenged, severely mentally challenged. <laughs> this is where we're at. Is that, like Trudeau's got to so many scandals that their literal excuse is like, yeah, where word I want to use, mentally challenged. And they said, oh, we, no one knew the history. Christopher Freeland is from Ukraine. He was a journalist. She has like master's degree. She has like ex legit expertise in Ukrainian far right neo Nazi history. Like that's literally her area of expertise. So no one understood the implications when we said he was in. He was in the Waffen SS. He like pledged allegiance personally to Adolf Hitler. He fought. He hard. fought with Soviets. Yeah. So obviously he was Nazi. <laughs> yeah. Like, listen, there's there's a there's a there's an excuse I can get for a lot of people, right? And I think I can apply this to India too, right? If you're in a Ukrainian farmer and there's the Holodomor, war, like the Soviet Union literally said, okay, no food in Ukraine. We're just going to take away all the food and 7 million Ukrainians died. If you're some Ukrainian farmer who just picked up arms and you started fighting against the Russians and then you ended up in like near some German battalion during the war because, you know, you were, the Soviets are also bad guys, right? The Nazis are evil. The Soviets were evil. It was making a deal with the devil to fight a devil. 
right? I, I can understand that. This is the Waffen SS. And this is the same thing that a lot of propaganda is now being used against India in the West is like Kandra Bose, who, who made it some alliance with Hitler. But you can look at yep. that as like, well, look at what happened in India during British colonialism there. Um, Churchill, who's a hero of the West and probably saved us from the Nazis, was very anti-India and intentionally instigated a famine there. Four, four million people died because of Churchill in India. In exactly. Kolkata, in West Bengal, in East Bengal, four million people died because he diverted all the rations from, from, the, uh, from Bengal to UK in the Second World War. He diverted so much of ration that there was no ration in Bengal. So exactly. there were four million people died without food. So does that mean that Chandra Bose was like, I hear Hitler and I love this whole cleanse the world of the Jews thing? Or was this, we have 4 million of our own people dying because of the British, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So again, does that make everyone there uh, a Nazi? No, like you can understand that, right? But That's if, true. If, if, if people in India were like, oh, Nazis reading about it, oh, this is great. Can I join this SS? Went over to Europe and like, we're in the concentration camp. You're like, I love killing. Okay, then they are Nazis. But you know, this this needs a bit more historical context here. And like, this is the the lie that's being against Hindutva, far right Hindu nationalism. Look, they have they have roots in the Nazi party. Look at all these Indian people with swastikas. And you're like, that's a Hindu religious symbol. And you know, so you can like they're they're in, in a world war. I can excuse a lot of people for joining a side or the other for. <laughs> For, for in like you know if you were in Ethiopia and and your internal tribal politics put you on either the side of the Italians or the British, I, I don't as a, as a Jewish person I don't say oh, they sided with them they must hate me like I can understand there right um, you know th th there is historical context but to this guy he literally joined the Waffen SS like the hardline ideological super Nazis he to get in there you have to pledge allegiance to Adolf Hitler and the cause and the final solution and all that. He was informed. He was told. He knew what was going on. He's like, yep, genocide. Let's go. Let's do it. Um, so, and then this guy gets honored in the parliament. So the lack of vetting. Some of them, some of them used to cut from here to, to here. I, I hope you know that. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the super Nazis, mm -hmm. they used to cut from, uh, from here to here. I mean, if you look at the first guy who became the chief of NASA, uh, the the guy who who was a Nazi, but Americans, you know, yeah, asked the, him I to. Mean, so did the Russians. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things of of the war. Is like the Nazis had a lot of scientists, and they were divvied up between the Soviets, exactly, and, and the Americans. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, it's one of the. I mean, uh, the Japanese too. I mean, the Japanese kind of got off a lot of criticism for what they did uh, because they shared all the information of of the human experimentation they did. With the rest of the world mm -hmm. so like what do you hear like you, this isn't an india thing um because you guys don't have cold um but in in our countries there's like records on like frostbite we'll say like oh this much frostbite at this amount of time and exposure would mean it's 20 minutes at this until a limb falls off like where do we have this numbers of like when would a limb fall off on exposure to the cold japanese uh pow camps where they march pow's out into the the, the thing had the temperature and then had them naked and just timed how long it would take for things to think frostbite, how long it would take for these limbs to, to literally corrode or fall you're, off. You're, you're putting thoughts in my mind as a stand-up comedian, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad Japanese POW camps will be in uh, your next uh, set. I think we do well together. So when I come to India, you'll have to show me around, get me into some of the clubs. If we're doing yeah, yeah, POW, if, if, does India love uh, POW humor? Like I, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna fit in better than I thought. Um, but yeah, this is so. You know, again. But they used they used Indian prisoners as well uh, as as you know uh, to practice the the shooting. They used Indian prisoners too. So we have we have written proofs that Japanese were were hitting Indian prisoners as well. Yeah, I mean the Japanese were pretty. Imperial Japan is not a fun place, um, and I'm glad that. Japan has now joined the rest of the free world and, you know, the Japanese culture has evolved since. But don't you think, but don't you think that the people, anybody, okay, all right, if I, if my ancestors were brutal, okay, mm -hmm. there is a, there is a little fire which is there inside me, okay, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, okay, even mm -hmm. if whatever I claim from the outside, but I have that fire and I'm sure about it, I have that fire, be it positive or negative, do you agree with this? And then we'll go on LGBTQT community. Okay, I mean, yeah. Listen, is there some sort of cultural transference of of grievances? 
and and ideologies, yeah, um, to an extent. But I do think you know it can be changed and outside pressure leveraged on them. Like the Japanese were embarrassed and humiliated by the end of the World War. Like they were a culture of never surrender. Like the reason why, you know, one of the reasons why they had to nuke uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima is because they gamed out what it would be like to to invade Tokyo, and everyone was there was prepared to fight to the death, grab a samurai sword, you know, the, the, the clearing of the island hopping in Japan was pretty brutal. Like the, 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 the determination of the Japanese soldier to, to the fight. Kamikazes. The kamikazes thing, like that was real, right? People flying yeah, yeah. planes into aircraft carriers. Like, they were the oh, first suicide bombers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it, it was a culture like that. And, but you saw when they were defeated and had to like admit defeat, there was a scar put in the Japanese thing. And, then, you know, you, you can say there's... Maybe they accepted. Hmm? Maybe they accepted, you know. They accepted yeah. that we were supposed to change. You they, I think they did. They accepted. They came face to face. They were forced to sort of back down, right? Once you this god emperor thing is defeated, once the emperor who is a god is defeated, you know, that 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 will change your mentality, right? When, yep. you, when, you, when, when, you, when you are no longer invincible and have to face that. That changes mentality. So, yeah, that we have these cultures that go, and like this is the current Israel Hamas thing. You could say in a bit, like Hamas needs to be defeated, right? The Islamist radicals need to see that God is not on their side, um, that they they cannot be protected. Like to change the culture there for any long term peace, you know, there's going to have to be a significant defeat of Hamas, and it's that's a hard thing to say. Like it's hard to talk about like the positives and negatives of nuclear bombs on on civilian populations like Hiroshima and and Nagasaki. Like when you get to war and politics, thinking gets hard and it's difficult and and morality becomes a bit cloudy and it and you have to navigate that in a way. But yeah, it it I I I I would say there is something to what you said, but I don't think it's permanent. I do think it is in a sense also malleable by outside forces. So we can go to the LGBTQ blah 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 but before that, one one last question about okay. the politics uh, on the Hamas and Israel thing. Okay, so when when Hamas does the brutality at the level they have done, don't you think that they are pushing the people, the right-minded people, okay, to to they they are pulling them to their levels to create to take the revenge of that level? Because what is happening is that the civilizations which are genuinely civilized. They have been tolerating ISIS, they have been tolerating Hamas, they have been tolerating Hezbollah. In India, we are tolerating lashkar e taiba and, and all that, uh, whatever, X, Y, Z from Pakistan. Don't you think that slowly and gradually they're pushing the civilized world to behave in their way, to teach them a lesson so they feel how it feels when you when you behave like that? Yeah, like... I think yeah, you're right. Like this has been all over the the West and even the East. You point out like the the sort of naive tolerance of of Islamist extremism and other types, right? Khalistani, Kami. You know, we're pretty good at fighting neo Nazis now in the West, but that's the only type of extremism we're we're fighting. I think that Hamas went too far too quickly. In another generation, I think a lot more people would be very happy with seeing dead, raped, and murdered Jews. And a lot of people were very happy in the West. But it was such a horrifying thing that it did shock a lot of people to to see just the face of what this is and the face of the people who supported it. I think it was too much too quickly. I think maybe another generation or two, you could see images like this and, you know, um, I mean, you still have like Harvard student unions and professors being like, this is justifiable. This is the face of decolonization, blah, 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 blah. Right? And you talk about decolonization, like Jews are but, from. But look at it. Look at it. Uh, one more point. Look at it. Yeah. The BLM, the Black Lives Matter. Exactly. Jews have never hurt blacks in their entire, the entire thing from when Jews are existing. If you see, I, I haven't heard read where Jews have attack, attacked blacks. They have protected them most of the time. But BLM supported Palestine and did you see that that symbol which they yes, put on yes the Chicago BLM where they where they celebrated um the paraglider so that was the Hamas mili- uh, terrorists coming down to a music festival of mostly people who probably support black lives but matter but why blacks why blacks why so, are they I doing mean, this? so i mean the history between black and jewish communities is very very good under martin luther king right uh, solidarity it was a bunch of jewish lawyers who set up the NAACP 
um, and uh, yeah, help, the, help the black community form it. And Martin Luther King and the Jewish community worked very hand in hand. Malcolm X did not. Uh, Malcolm X, if you read his biography, the, the only guy who's ever kind to him who's white as a kid and like takes some mentorship and kind of treats him as a surrogate son is a Jewish businessman. But then he gets into jail and he gets falls in um, with the Nation of Islam, which isn't even Islam. It's just this lunatic fever dream um, about like the scientist Yaakov who created white people as of like it's it's insane nonsense that they believe. Um, but this fringe quasi Islamic, it's not quasi Islamic um, cult got a lot bigger. I mean, uh, eventually Malcolm X realizes that this, he goes to the airport and is like, wait, this isn't Islam. Like, okay, I'm leaving this. And then they assassinate him. And Farrakhan's been very open with like, he had a part in taking out uh, Malcolm X, but he'll still use his name to push his, uh, to push his own popularity. So you have hyper radicals in the black community, like Louis Farrakhan with massive followings um, who prescribe to a rabidly insane, very anti-Semitic ideology right? Farrakhan's on the record. He loves Hitler, praises Hitler. Jews are this, Jews are that. He spread, you know, he spreads a conspiracy that Jews were, were the ones involved in the slave trade, even though there was 20 Jewish families in the entire South. And like not even families on slave, like you're talking 20 families in the entire South. Yes, they were running the slave trade. Um, I think like, yes, some Jews own slaves um, in the West or whatever. But like, again, like slave... Who like who didn't? who didn't who didn't prior to the 1800s like <laughs> literally you know slavery was there so there's this narrative pushed uh, a lot in the alt right and then and the islamist community that you know Jews are behind the slave trade there was an instagram post with like no references a couple years ago that just claimed 78% of all slave owners were jewish um it was never a thing but that just became a new fact to to put out and the women's march and all these people go go with it so there's been a tolerance of this type of extremism um, and, and and radicalization under like you know the black liberation movement, uh, which has gone further and further into the radical left. So that once you get to BLM, you have a bunch of stupid kids who who don't know the history. They weren't alive in the '60s. Uh, you know they they don't know you know that it was you know Jewish civil rights leaders and and organizers and and and, and lawyers who who were helping MLK organize and, and raise legal fees and defend him when he went to prison and set up their organizations. And like when black people couldn't go into register things because of the segregationist laws, the Jews would go in and do it for them. And like, there's, there's, there's none of that being remembered in the BLM thing. Now there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of black leaders who do remember this and do speak out. But once they do that, again, they don't want to be highlight mainstream media doesn't want to highlight that um, because I, listen, I, I don't know the reason why, but it, it's just kind of the way it is. So you've you've had this sort of um, fervor, um, you know, fomented mostly by the Nation of Islam, uh, and the Nation of Islam is seen as a like a legitimate thing in a lot of parts of the Black community, and it's not. It's it's an outright cult that believes insane things. It's not even Islam. Like I don't want to be Islamophobic. Like, I'm I'm going to defend all the Muslims in the world and be like Muslims. I get it. Like. The nation of Islam is Looney Tunes insane, and it has nothing to do with your religion. Quite literally, even though it's the nation of Islam, I don't even consider it Islam. So, it's so, the... so let me let me let me do do a little, little comparison for you, okay? One point nine eight billion Muslims, one percent. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say one percent are radicalized. That comes out to be one point eight nine eight million people in that range. Mm -hmm. And the second point is that uh, it took only eight hundred people from Hamas to do what they did. Please exactly. go ahead and, and, and please well, please tell me how should I not be a guy who's scared of well, you know somebody? Yeah, it's listen. It's the one percent of the one percent of one point nine billion people are radical. It's just the one percent of one percent. Okay, that's one hundred ninety thousand people, all with collision costs. That's the standing army. That's the standing might of the entire Roman legion at its peak. The entire Roman legion um, at its peak, and instead of needing swords and shields and to move together, they can all have collision costs. And go off at any time they want. So you're still talking if it's one percent of one percent, that's still a lot of people who can cause immense chaos globally. And that's I mean, that's that's not the official number, that's just the the thing we flippantly say, as you pointed out, the one percent of the one percent number okay. numbers may be higher because there are yeah, people who are putting twenty like percent yeah. as well. I mean, like militants, like how do we classify the Muslim Brotherhood as well? Like, are people who who prescribe the Muslim Brotherhood, are they you know, terrorists, but like they're clearly extremists, right? Hamas is the militant wing of the Muslim Brotherhood and they support each other. Like, so it's like, 
you know, Sam, this is the thing like Sam Harris got yelled at by Ben Affleck over on Bill Maher infamously, right? Where he tried to drop the yeah, yeah. You remember this, right? Where he's like, okay, you have the jihadis in this little circle. I guess you 1%, 1%. Then around that circle would be like the Islamists, like, you know, that's um, Jamaat e Islami, Hezbollah Tahrir, the Muslim Brotherhood, and that. And then around that circle is like, you know, the wider Muslim community. And like, how do we parse that out? Um, that's the thing. And, and I think both of the inner circles present a significant problem. Like, so the jihadis, you saw what they can do and what they want to do. And they're very clear. It doesn't stop at the Jews. I mean, Hindus they, know. They were like, they, they're like the, that joker from, from Dark Knight, right? They, yeah. they can't be bought, bullied, or negotiated. They just want to see the world burn, actually. Exactly. There, there, are, <laughs> there is evil in the world, and it has to be confronted. And they're sort of like, oh, we have to understand where they're coming from. They saw the, this and that. It's like, you don't say that about the Jews, who in the 1900s, 1920s, had to experience the, the pogroms of Fadayin, Right, the the massacre at Hebron, the Arab revolts and riots of the 1930s, um, where the Arabs committed so much violence in 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 Israel uh, that they forced the British to um, restrict Jewish immigration to the territory during the Holocaust um, because there was just so much violence and and malevolence from uh, that population. Again, Haji Amin Al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was close personal friends with Adolf Hitler. He went to Bosnia to rally a bunch of Muslim troops to join the SS. And uh, he was able to get enough troops to push back the partisans in Hungary uh, who were blocking the railroads. So they were able to deport about a half a million more people to the death camps because of his contributions. So, you know, it's not like, oh, this, this, this is a cycle of violence that's gone wherever. Think of it. And their children died and their children, this is a war that's going to end forever. No. There's a genocidal ideology behind all of this. And it only gets a, oh, the sympathy is only ever applied to one side. There's never, like, do you think, so the Israelis who survived this terrorist attack and saw their family members burned, raped, and mutilated, the people who excuse the people who did it, are you going to excuse those Israelis for what they are going to do? Like, if, 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 listen, if someone who survived this terrorist attack goes out a few months from now, goes and breaks into, you know, somewhere in like, I don't know, uh, yes, Day Bliss or somewhere in the West Bank and, you know, rapes a family and then burns them alive, death penalty. For him, yep. terrorist, death penalty. There's no excuse. I Like, I could be like, listen, I understand you hurt and what you went through is horrible. You still deserve to die. And, and it's not that hard. It's not that hard to say burning people alive and mass murder is wrong. Like, but it's only ever why, why the why why the BBCs, why the New York Times, why every media house, including Times uh, from Washington Post. So so look at the look at the uh, these media houses. But let's look at the bigger picture. Actually, let's look at the billionaires who own these these agencies for example when you segregate the billionaires do you know whom you find who's 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 been very logical so far it's only elon musk rest of the people are either silent or they don't talk i mean they're silent or they're supporting it george soros is a jew right yeah, he's, he's yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's literally supporting so, yeah. so the people, who, that, that's what I want to know from you, that, that where do you see all these things is going? Because for me, it's very chaotic. Yeah, it's, it's chaotic. Like, I mean, this is why I lose my mind when people are like, oh, there's a thing like George Soros meme, being against George Soros, that's anti-Semitism. You're like, what? Any good Jew should hate George Soros. Hate this man, right? For being involved as a Nazi collaborator. Back in the day, like, you know, he, he wasn't a Holocaust survivor. He was a collaborator. Okay, fine. He was a teenager, whatever. But his entire life has been dedicated to undermining um, the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Like, the, the, like well, so it's not anti-Semitic to criticize George Soros. There is an anti-Semitic way to criticize George Soros. If you're criticizing George Soros for being part of the global Zionist homosexual agenda, well, then, yeah, you're probably an anti-Semite because you don't know what you're talking about because George Soros funds every anti-Zionist organization on the planet. So if you're criticizing George Soros for what he is doing and the malevolent influence you think he has on the world, yeah, he's a billionaire. He's worth criticism. I'm with you. I'll join you and whatever. But if you start criticizing George Soros like a lunatic for, again, like supporting being a Zionist warmonger globalist, you're like, okay, not a Zionist, very anti-Zionist. So you're, that's just a person screaming about Jews. And, and, and I get it. That's hard to parse out sometimes, but you've got to be able to like, 
you got to be able to tell when people have legitimate criticism of someone, which is most of the time. And yes, there is some anti-Semitic criticism of George Soros that is deranged, but it doesn't mean the guy gets to be protected from criticism. He's a friggin' billionaire. You know, he has, a, if, if he, if his feelings are hurt, you can just pour some money on it. Just, just pour some money on it. Just put a bunch of hundred dollar bills and just pour some money on it and you'll be fine. You'll be fine, George. What about uh, pay for slave funds? You know, the ah, people, yes, yes. The, the Hamas people who are getting paid just to kill Jews. I mean, and, and, and on just to a supplementary question to it, there are N number of Christian nations. There are N number of Muslim nations, but they can't tolerate one Jew nation. Why is that? And there is zero, zero Hindu nations, but at least one Jew nation is yeah. there which is fighting for existence. Why can't they tolerate one Jew nation? Because they're anti-Semitic. That's the thing. It's, it's it's a hatred of Jews. I'll give you one correction on the thing. The paper slay. It's not Hamas. It's the moderates who do that. The Palestinian Authority. The moderates. Okay. Uh, so that's also it's not. So that's also your tax dollars if you're Canadian. So I pay taxes, and those taxes go to the United Nations, and they use to fund uh, relief, and they go to the Palestinian Authority for relief efforts, humanitarian, whatever. And they say their most important thing is this martyr fund, as they call it. But the Lawfare Project revealed it in court. There's a whole pay for slave program that like, if you're a terrorist and like you commit, like depending on where you're from, depending where you commit the terrorist attack, depending how many people you kill, there's a whole pay scale that you, that your family gets per month, depending on what type of, how good you are as a terrorist. So the highest paid people in Palestinian society are terrorist members, families. So this is why you go to, you go to jail you're seen as a hero. The government then subsidizes your family for life. This is why the Israelis will knock down the homes of terrorists as a deterrent here in response to the pay for slave thing. So it's like, okay, if your family's going to become rich, if you're a terrorist, well, the incentive to be a terrorist is, is higher than even to be a doctor. Like why go to medical school and train for eight years to make a, make, you know, X amount of dollars a year when you can make X plus $3 a year. If you just go kaboom, right. Or boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Right. If you take it, if you just run your car into people like this is the highest paid other than the leaders who are in five star hotels in Qatar, other than the leaders who are legit billionaires. Aside from the money, the other money goes to the terrorists. So the Israelis had to say, OK, we need to make some financial disincentive to being a terrorist. So you're a terrorist. We knock down your, your family home. So the, so, you know, it's not like this great financial reward. Everyone is a terrorist. Like there needs to be some sort of thing there. And then, of course. When this is reported in media, it's like Israel bulldozing Palestinian homes, and then, and the UN calls it ethnic cleansing. And you're like, that's a home of someone who rammed a car into a school kid uh, for the purpose of, of mass murder, then got out with a knife and went to go stab someone else. He's getting paid by my fucking tax dollars to do that, and 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 that's why the home is being demolished. But we always omit context to build the narrative we want to build, such as life. So, so one more thing. Okay. So if, if I open my command center inside a hospital, if I open my command center inside a, 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 an apartment, if I open my command center inside a school intentionally, so when the Jews bomb it, I could show the kids and say, you know what? They have killed the kids. Don't you think it's a little boring now? It's been repeated so many times that, you know, I mean, I don't, unfortunately, and I, I'm feel sorry for the kids, but it's just boring now, I and mean, it's enough. I mean, I have seen it last six months ago, maybe two years ago, five years ago. I mean, same thing. Oh, look, hey, la, la, look at this kid, kill these kids, and they have killed. Oh, enough. I have seen. Why did you make your command center inside a hospital? Who asked you? You kill them, not the Jews, not Israel. It's you who kill them by making your center inside a hospital. I mean, you're right. This has been Hamas. They've never said they do anything different. They always have been very clear with their strategy and their threats. If you listen to Hamas on like you know, when their officials go on like, you know, Lebanese or TV or whatever, their, their essential threat is, we will destroy Israel. And I don't care how many Palestinians I have to kill to do it. I love dead Palestinians. And it's the whole, the Jews love life. We love death. Their parents will be taken care of. They'll be martyrs. Like we'll, we'll, we'll kill as many Palestinians just as a propaganda thing. We love death. We're going to kill us all. Like that's the insanity of the threat is like, if you don't let us kill you, we're going to start killing each other. Okay. And like, that's the threat. And then it's like, but if we start killing each other, we're going to then blame you and professors and, 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 and the Democrats and then the, the liberal party will come and chastise you because that's the insane world we live in. 
right? So normal people see this and go, what is, are they talking about? This is insane. But uh, respected foreign policy experts who know better than all of us because they have a degree in being stupid from Johns Hopkins University, they can see more. They Listen, when a terrorist says what he says, they have the educational power and mental flexibility to actually say, you know what? What he actually is, means genocide, something. Yeah. It means I wasn't hugged as a kid, and that's the fault of the Jews. So, like, yeah. <laughs> It, so I don't it. understand. Okay, I don't understand. Okay, all right. So I have a, a specific book. I'm not going to name it. So I have a specific book. It, there are some verses, some lines in the book, which literally asks me to do X, Y, Z things. But uh, my expert comes and says, "You no, no, no. Even if it says it, you are supposed to understand it differently because I understand it differently. So, you know, it's like uh, in India, we say that, you know, you can't eat a fly right there in your food if you could see it. You know, I mean, that's what these people are trying to do. They want us to, you know, eat a uh, 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 bad food because it might. And and I don't understand this deranged thought process. For example, this girl in Germany, she got raped by six Arab men. OK, she goes to the police and says, I was raped, raped by six white German men. I'll give you another example. A young lady was gang raped in Germany by Arabs. OK. I'm not saying all Arabs do it, but unfortunately, it's a pattern that we're seeing spike in Europe. It's a thing. Arab Muslims. She goes to the police and says, I was gang raped. They said, please describe your attackers. And she says it was six white Germans. Did you hear that story? Yeah, something like that. I mean, I, I, I don't. And, and she said these people are persecuted. And hence, I did not name them because these Arab Muslims are already being persecuted in, in my country. So, I mean, where is, this, where is the honesty in, in, in doing such things? Well, it's 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 not. I think it's it's the greater good, right? This is sort of the social constructionist argument um, towards life, and this is like Obama era foreign policy, Trudeau foreign policy, going back to Biden. It's I call it. I can hug the terror. It's the Obama speech in Cairo 20, 2009 is is sort of flagship for for this ideology, and it goes something like you know social constructionist idea. So the problem with society is that the social system uh, is not set up in the way I want it to be, and if we just change this policy, this thing, we can top down create a perfect society. The problem is there's people who are not fitting in to the utopian ideology. So yeah, there's there's sort of this social constructionist overview, right? So it's a top down. If you put in the perfect systems and the people have the right attitudes, utopia can follow, right? And there's a big problem because of course, racism is a big problem driving a lot of the inequities. So even if you are brutalized yourself, the way she might be constructing this is if I want these things to stop, if I want to stop rape and murder and bring apart a better world, we have to, you know, top down social construct. And, you know, she probably believes that the reason why people who are not white commit crimes is because of racism. So by not being racist and lying and contributing to the better world, she will build a better world. And we, we've just seen enough evidence that this isn't true, that there is That's no true. reason with these people that evil must be confronted, that in parts of the world that are not the West and they're like, you know, or India or South Korea or Japan, Israel will throw in there. Diversity is not our strength. Strength is our strength. That that's is true. that that's that's the way of the world. <laughs> that's you yeah. want you want Internet. What's what is international law? International law is might makes right. That's the one law. And then there's a bunch of bullshit under that. But so 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 uh, and that's why, you know, and that's why Obama allowed thieves to steal up to nine hundred dollars in, in San Francisco and California. And that's where the cities are becoming ghost cities. Anyways, let's come back to the, the LGBT. OK, I wanted to share my screen to you a little bit. I All hope right. you have seen this. But to my the people who are watching this, I wanted to show them that this, this is what been what has been taught in the American schools. Okay, so guys, uh, the, the people in India, like my daughter goes to pathways. I am a little scared uh, because, you know, this is what been- Oh yeah, gender, yeah, this available. This, one, yeah. Yeah, this is what has been available in the school libraries for the ch children of age 10, 12, uh, eight, nine, 10, 12. This is the visual I would be picturing and whatever. And, and it's scary. I mean, do you think that 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 the that the right of LGBTQ was was a great idea, 
but now they have pushed it a little too much yeah i mean it's sort of like too far too quickly like you're you're in this echo chamber where you're like these institutions have been corrupted by radicals so you get into these like school board things or the curriculum whatever and it's crazy commie crazy commie crazy commie coward 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 and maybe one guy who isn't but he's not gonna like he'll get kicked out so it's it's commies and cowards who've been doing a lot of the things and they've been in this echo chamber and then when you take this stuff to the general population who hasn't been in this echo chamber for years they're gonna sort of react with like wait what like this is a bridge too far i don't want my kids learning this and this is also a a push from you see i think the the radical left is to like sort of turn everyone political like to to de sanctify the the innocence of a child like to, to destroy childhood innocence to make because they want to turn listen a lot of people say well it's pedophiles who want to do the thing to 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 to, to excuse pedophilia and there is an element to that all right there and listen every it's not, i don't think this is created like well you can look at a lot of like jack derrida and the french people who did actually support pedophilia but yes this this is a great movement the um sort of what do you call it um you know sexual studies or whatever queer theory you know queer theory is great for any pedophile because it it removes the innocence of a child it blurs those lines you can use it and abuse it but i actually do think the push to um to take away the innocence of the child is not so like the weirdos can have sex with them although they will take advantage of that and you know if you're a pedophile you should be joining the queer theory movement because it is your number one fan but it's more to turn the child into an activist and a radical. It's to say that the children must be turned into the next generation of ideological soldiers. And we must bombard them with messaging, right? So by destroying this 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 distinction between adult and child, right, and all that, um, it, it it allows them to say, all right, we're going to take these seven-year-olds. And you hear the stories that I have a friend who called me like his seven-year-old daughter was like exposed to this nonsense and told that Canada was this great evil thing. And like she's having a hard time dealing with all this. And she's confused and scared because she's a bright girl, but she's also seven. And there's things that even if your seven-year-old is is bright and precocious and at the you know the second standard deviation above the mean in her class, and you and you just love her because you see such a great future for her. Seven-year-olds are still seven-year-olds, and there's things that she's not going to be able to properly comprehend and deal with. And at some point in her life, when she's 14, 15, she could deal with a certain issue. Some of them you might need to be 18, 19. Some you know, our brains aren't fully developed till 25. There's certain things in life that that you just, you know, adults can handle better than kids. And and we're blurring this line between a like a, a 35 year old and a seven year old. And and it's and it I think it's the push by the radicals to try and make ideological soldiers for the next generation because they want to capture the so, so if you if you look at it, I mean, especially this, I I don't know much about Canada, but because I keep going to the United States. What they have done is they have created the nuclear families where one mother gets paid more just to make sure the father stays away. She gets paid more from the government. And, and I was listening to the interview of a pedophile who said that any kid who is with a single mother was my biggest target. If the kid had a father, I used to stay away from the kid. But if the kid had only mother, that was my target because I knew nothing much will happen. And then from there, if somebody is giving this reason that I want pedophiles to stay from my kid, so where is these two things are, you know, that they are, don't you think they're they are not fulfilling each other? Yeah, it is a bit of a, yeah, maybe you could say self-fulfilling prophecy here. Um, yeah, I mean, you could say there's some good intentions between, between behind, um, you know, the push in the 60s from the Democrats to, we, you, you know, let's say make it up to the black community, which deserved it, right? There was Jim Crow, there was slavery. To, to say that black people in America had any sort of equal treatment prior to then um, would be an outright lie, right? So you want to do something. But the this is sort of like maybe was the, the cure worse than the disease here? Because again, it was the financial incentivizing of single parenthood. Single, uh, like the number one predictor of like, you know, childhood success you know is is there a father in the home or are you in a community with a low single mother rate because you know someone your dad might die of cancer when you're three and yeah, your mom yeah. raising you and your brother single-handedly but you know you have a couple uncles you know the people in in the apartment buildings next to you they have fathers so there are male role models that you can look up to and you see positive fatherhood uh, 
things. It's not also your father also didn't abandon you. It just unfortunately died, right? There's there's not that, but you know, it's like number one predictor of criminality: single motherhood. Number two, education level, right? And yeah. and and those tie in together. But you know, it's one of the taboos that we can't address because we want to say, oh, it's socioeconomic things. Poverty causes crime. That's not true. It's not true. If you're in, there are areas, uh, you know, my co colleague Wyatt Claypool, the National Telegraph, he's writing a, a thesis statement on crime right now. He's just giving me a whole lecture. But, um, you know, there are places in Toronto where there are lower incomes and very low crime compared to other areas that have higher average income and lots of crime. Why? Single motherhood, education level. So even though they have more money, they have more crime because higher single motherhood rates, lower education levels. Same as in India. I mean, uh, this is the last thing, but same as in India. I mean, India has immense poverty in some of the sections, but but if you look at it, India's uh, per capita is around twenty seven hundred dollars, and if you look at uh, the uh, the the Indian people, uh, the, the crime rate per hundred thousand in America, there are twenty people behind the bar. In India, there's just three people behind the bar per hundred thousand, but which is also a lot because you know we are a lot. So yeah, I, I've, I've noticed there's a few of you. <laughs> so uh, so that's it from my side, man. I, I love talking to you. Okay, and and if you have time, we could we could be in touch with each other in future as well. That's that's what so, came up. Yeah, and we'll be in touch because if you, if you do comedy, I do comedy. Eventually, when you come to India, I wanna. If you come, we will have a tour. I mean, I'll, I'll just you know we'll right, we'll, yeah. we'll plan something out maybe. I'll be, we'll I'll, plan I'll be in touch. I, You're I very might, popular in India. You should I know, know I might, that. I might be there sooner than people think. So um, yeah. if I do, I would like to yell at Calistanis by day and crack jokes at night. Sure, sure, absolutely, All absolutely. Right. Appreciate it, man. Thank you very Thanks much for coming me. to my show. Appreciate it. Thank right. you. Thank you.